Oh, wait. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I welcome you all to another installment of Table Talk, a series of conversations with people who um, who write on animal relations and who just work on human animal issues with the Indian Animal Studies Collective. I'm Susan and my co-host Anu Pandey is also here. The Indian Animal Studies Collective aims to bring together academics, activists, and writers who are, who are thinking about animals in India. Today, we have with us Alok Hisawala Gupta from Center for Research on Animal Rights to talk about how cruelty is used as a concept with regards to animal rights discourses in India. Um, it's a very informal discussion, so please feel free to um, unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand or put a question in the chat box. Now, thanks so much, Alok, for accepting our invitation. I thought we could begin the discussion by talking about one of the main points that you make in the scroll article as well as in the report, which is that a record, keeping a record of cruelty is very important. Um, do you think uh, keeping such a record would be important legally or would it have uh, other implications as well? Uh, so, uh, uh, dear uh, Susan and Anu, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I've heard so much about the collective from Krishna Oni Hari uh, for years and it's very nice and, and a real honor to be invited to come and speak here. And as I said, I'm uh, not a, I mean, I understand this is a great space of, 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 of social sciences and animal rights and animal studies, uh, but I come from a slightly different perspective. I'm a lawyer by training and my work is in legal activism and political activism around animal rights. And uh, and uh, so I kind of, my the questions I raise in my work and in my writing and my research are really about both, both as an activist and as a, and as a, as a, as a legal thinker about how the, some of these concepts that we use and how useful they are. I mean, uh, the cruelty concept is a very interesting concept and, uh, and it's a very unique concept according to me, which is largely only applied in reference to non-human animals. It's very important to understand that because the cruelty concept is not something that is used in that commonly uh, in, in, in reference to uh, uh, human animals. Uh, the record keeping as an issue is something that is actually incidental to my research in the report, but then it became very significant in the report because when I started the report work uh, with FIAPO uh, many years ago, uh, uh, I, you know, the, my first th thought was, let me see what is the data of uh, crimes against animals. And, uh, and the funny thing is, we actually do have we actually do have uh, a fantastic national database called the National Crime Records Bureau, which is has a huge office in Delhi, and and the entire job of that bureau is to create and collate national statistics on crime in India, and so we get we get a sense of uh, both policing issues and crime issues and and you know just in, it's also a window in our society and understanding the challenges society is facing. What I found very unique in, I didn't actually expect to find a lot of animal statistics, but I did not expect a complete lack of animal statistics considering the central legislation called the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, very integral to our legal system and it's been around since the 1960s. Actually, it's been around for years, hundreds of years, 200, 150 years. So I, uh, but when I went to the office of NCRB in Gurgaon, I was, they were shocked when I asked them if they had any statistics on crimes against animals. They were actually very confused. And we kept this very weird co conversation. <laughs> and it was a real experience with Babu Dam because, you know, somebody called somebody, then they called somebody else. They thought I was a journalist. They thought I was going to take a coat. And in the end, they were very embarrassed. And they said, you know, no one's ever come and asked us this question. And, and I said, why would you not collect cases of crimes against animals? Because he said, oh, but we are only concerned with crimes. And, you know, and that was very interesting for me because cruelty is not a crime. You know, and, and I think that's why I got very interested. Is that the, the lack of record keeping for me became a signal of 
invisibilization of the animal victim. It was actually, for me, it was a really good window to understand, uh, you know, sort of the way in which, despite a seemingly progressive law, or the very fact that this law exists, uh, the uh, crimes against animals are not seen as crimes. And actually, so that's one of the main crux of my report, actually. The, the, the core point of the report is that, which is why we actually call, we subtitled the report as Crimes Against Animals, because we chose to, we, you know, we decided, uh, when Varda was, uh, uh, Varda and I was working with me, uh, guided me through this, Varda and I decided that, you know, we should really push uh, the language that we find is abs uh, lacking right now. So we, we so, so for me, the only reason I insist on record keeping is, is to create some kind of parity. I think a record keeping could be the beginning of creating a parity between crimes against animals and crimes against humans. So, so that's Right. I just want to ask something about the, the parity. Is this parity with human beings or is it parity across all living beings? Because, you know, the, the point that you make about statistics is interesting because when we think about humans and statistics, now one of the things a lot of people say is that in a lot of uh, social sciences, humans are often reduced to numbers whenever we're discussing a crisis or a disaster. But in the report, one of the points that you're making is that such a record in statistics or in numbers is important because the anecdotes or the stories of cruelty is not enough because there are a lot of cases of cruelty recorded in the newspaper. We can see stories or uh, new stories about uh, about animal cruelty. So do you think the parity that you want, is that parity with human beings? No, so I mean, that's a very interesting question, Susan. And, uh, and I think, uh, uh, I mean, I think we come from different mediums uh, and different faculties of sciences which approach these questions very differently. But uh, I will agree, I am not seeking parity with human beings. I, my, my, the goal of my work is not to seek some, uh, I don't know what the concept of equality with human beings would be right now. So I don't, that's not something I'm seeking. And I'm not a, I, neither am I a proponent of legal personal for animals. That's not a space I come from. For me, the issue really is how the nature of crime, how do we look at crime itself? Because I think what's, what is important for me is to understand the same, so let me, give you, let me give you an example to answer your question, okay? Uh, so one thing, okay, so I can accept that the National Crime Records Bureau did not maintain a database of any crimes under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act because it's a specific legislation. They decided to ignore the legislation for whatever wisdom, okay? But a lot of activists across India filed cases of crimes against animals under Section 328, 329, which is, uh, oh, sorry, 428, 429. Alvin is here, you can correct me, sorry, right now. Uh, which are uh, crimes of uh, uh, grievous injury to animals, and uh, and Section three seventy seven, which is uh, which is a, which is the uh, the, the anti sodomy law, uh, which is still used and has been used historically in current many times uh, to punish crimes of sexual abuse between uh, human actors and 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 non human animal uh, victims, quote unquote, and and uh, so for me, what was interesting was that I know for a fact that there are many complaints that have been filed across India, maybe in hundreds, uh, using the IPC to represent a case where an animal has been a victim of some kind of a crime. But that data itself has never been re recorded by the NCRB, which is actually recording data of rape and 377 and, uh, and, and different provisions under the IPC. So there is a deliberate omission of the, uh, because, and here I use victim in the context of the record, uh, record keeping, okay, because that, it's, it's the term that the uh, NCRB uses. So in all the victims it refers to, the animal victim who's a, a similar complaint has been filed, the law actually is concerned about the animal victim in whatever it's uh, 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 kind of misguided wisdom, because there's a lot to be critiqued about how the, how the IPC looks at animals. It's the deliberate omission is very problematic for me. So for me, I'm seeking parity not uh, with humans in particular, but I'm seeking some sort of a parity in our understanding of crime. Because, uh, you know, in our legal, in our feminist queer kind of thinking, we see crime, a lot of crime, especially gendered crime, as a, a sort of a, 
a product of structural societal uh, systems and or patriarchy or heteronormativity or uh, and or the intersection of these issues in, in class and society and caste. And I think somewhere, somewhere, uh, speciesism plays out in these ideas. And so I think, uh, so I'm looking at structural similarities. Why don't we have a political language? It's, it, my critique is actually across the board. We don't even have a political language around this. So for example, actually one of my main work has been looking at cases of animal sexual abuse, uh, something that uh, the, queer uh, the queer movement or the feminist movement has never sp spoken against. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, so my report, for example, documents 82 cases of animal sexual abuse, and uh, and these are cases. In many of these cases, uh, uh, FIRs are filed. Okay, in many of these cases, investigations have been done, charge sheets have been uh, the cases have been closed because they can't find the victim. Some cases, a charge sheet has been filed because the uh, the uh, perpetrator was found, and uh, and I have all these records, but. The NCRB had no mention of any of these cases, you know, when I correlated the report. So for me, that omission really bothered me. So it was so I'm I, I'm I'm speaking see, seeking parity in that sense. If that makes any sense. Sorry. And one of the things that really stood out to me in the report is that you you say that one of the aims is also to celebrate the work that activists do. And it's always seemed to me that activists are uh, always. Uh, the work that they do is seen as part of some separate, distinct social movement that nobody else is part of. So when we are trying to think of, uh, say, cruelty against animals uh, as a crime, so are we thinking about how would you position, um, say, an animal activist witnessing a crime and uh, kind of uh, making that uh, or transforming that into everybody witnessing. Because as we know, a lot of people just don't perceive something uh, against, uh, something that's done against animals as cruelty or as a crime. So how do we make this animal, the work that animal activists do, uh, what they can so easily obviously see as a crime matter to everybody else as well? I mean, so uh, it's, it's interesting questions. There are many facets to this question. Uh, and since you use the word witness, I'm obviously thinking of Nesargi Dave's fantastic paper on uh, witnessing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Nesargi's work uh, has really helped me examine and look at uh, animal uh, activists as uh, also kind of critically examine their work as animal saviors. But as they, you know, so we have a, we, we, and it's, it's a critique. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you a question in a slightly different way. Uh, uh, I both celebrate the work of animal activists. I also critique the work of animal activists because I think animal activists should not be, be with, uh, the work of animal activism should not be without any kind of scrutiny. It's very important. So, uh, so it's very, so for, for example, there is no, there is no presumed purity in being an activist. You know, just because you went and saved an animal, you should not be subjected to any scrutiny. That is not something I accept. Okay, there is no moral high ground in activism either, because it's not it's something you do because you want to do it. It's not something you do because you should be patted on your back for it. So, so that's something we are very clear. So, so then I think activism has its own ethical paradigms, right? So, like um, uh, animal activism in India, I actually think we today live in a society where a lot of people are outraged when they, when they see crimes against animals in public. If, a crime is witnessed in a public space, the level of outrage we see in society in public spaces is incredible. It's outstanding. It's mad. There is, you know, the, so whether it's social media or WhatsApp, news reports, it's mad. It's crazy. I mean, just this morning, there has been this really horrific video of a, uh, of a, a, a black hyena that was uh, killed in assault, assaulted and killed in Maharashtra uh, by some bunch of these guys just for fun and dragged for hours and it was just horrible and everything was filmed. And, uh, and Twitter is just, Twitter is full of like these crazy, crazy videos and lots of people tweeting and complaints and the entire forest department and the uh, police has kicked into action. So I think the problem is not, I think we are, your, I mean, maybe my experience is different from yours Susan, because you've done field work in a way that I haven't, but, uh, I don't, maybe 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we were looking at real apathy. I don't think there is apathy today. There's like a real kind of 
robust response against crimes against animals. I find it, for me, the vengeance with which that anger is represented is very problematic in today's society. Because for me, for me, I find animal activism is speaking a very dangerous language of incarceration, this constant demand for buying for blood. You know, I want this person arrested. I want this person hanged. I want this person killed. I can't, I can't handle this. I, I am not. I mean, you know, and for me, it's very important to go back to my root as a civil liberties activist, as a queer civil liberties activist. We've always argued that, uh, uh, you know, robbing somebody of their civil liberties as a, is not a solution to the problem at hand. So while I would like parity in crimes, I would like people to be prosecuted. I do not want them to be arrested and put in jail. I do not want, and I think we have to find new ways of punishment. And I find it very problematic in ways in which uh, animal activism today uh, is constantly, singularly obsessed with increasing punishment for the cruel, as if that is going to solve everything. This idea that if we increase punishment, the entire problem of crimes against animals will be solved overnight. You know, but this almost this kind of deep, you know, kind of, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very troubled by that. I, I'm very troubled by that, and I, uh, and it's a, maybe my reaction is uh, ill-founded. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little troubled by the response of animal activism today, to, uh, to the way in which uh, cruelty is represented. So I actually see, uh, I see horrible cruelty being perpetrated and a horrible response from animal activism. And I find both equally disturbing. And uh, so I'm sorry, it may, it may not be the answer you were looking for. But, uh, I, I, think, I think that's really interesting because, you know, as you also note in the report, the number of cases of cruelty, the number is rising. Um, and it seems to me that activists can't help but be frustrated by the rising number and so there's also this uh, this opposition between uh, animal activists, animal lovers, and just generally people who don't think it's as big an issue as, say, uh, violence against women or violence against other humans. So in such a case, uh, you know, it, it is a difficult position to be in. I mean, do you think activists are fighting against other humans and fighting against other humans to make them see what animal cruelty is I mean, isn't that what you're also trying to do so why are activists fighting against other humans first of all why can't activists have a dialogue with other people so i'm just answering you you know because look at look at the, your, your own question why is the why is the why is the language why is the language so combative why has the language become so combative because I know your question is responding to the what you're hear, hearing outside. It's an extremely combative language. I, you know, uh, uh, maybe I have an agenda. I mean, I, I believe I'm a strong pacifist. I believe strongly. I, I, I believe I'm a. I strongly believe that people should not be incarcerated. I believe that I believe the prison complex is a very problematic idea, and I believe that uh, while as activists, as human rights defenders, when we start asking for people to be arrested we actually start playing in the, into the hands of the police state. So for me, it's a very, very, very problematic kind of an approach to take. And I'm not asking everyone to have the same uh, pol politics as mine. And I'm not saying that my politics is better than other people's politics. It's just where I come from. Uh, uh, so let me give you an example of a fantastic work that's happening in our completely bizarre country right now, unexpected completely, of Section 39, in, uh, uh, of uh, Project 39A in Delhi. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, which is this fantastic project that is based out of the Delhi Law University, Law, Law, Law University campus, uh, started by the brilliant uh, Arup Surendranath, uh, which is, a, uh, which is a singularly focused on challenging death, death penalty commutations in the Supreme Court and High Courts. And through 10 years of dedicated work, they have now created a successful jurisprudence in Indian courtrooms of what's called mitigating circumstances. So for example, Indian courts now Indian courts now, while deciding the punishment, whether deciding whether death penalty is an appropriate punishment for in rarest of rare cases, are actually asking for a psych evaluation of the perpetrator. So this, this is actually really, this is, this is our modern jurisprudence today. And where uh, courts are actually appointing experts to go and spend time with the person in jail to understand why this person committed such a heinous crime and what led that person to commit such a heinous crime 
because the courts are now understanding and accepting then maybe a traditional methods of punishment are not the way to solve the issue let's go into the root cause of the issue and understand why this is happening and let's then with this kind of evidence in front of us let's try and understand how we can solve the problem because i think and this is not a new conversation right susan this is a this is an age old criminological criminology conversation I mean, all of us as lawyers in law school we've debated this ad nauseum right is punishment the end game is punishment the right solution is jailing people the right solution and i think this is an important conversation to have for us right now and i and i once again and i invoke my dear friend sr dave because nays has always argued that you know questions of ethics questions of ethics become very important in very difficult junctures so you know when you are standing at a very difficult juncture it's a very important point to actually ask yourself an ethical question and i think uh, and i think um, so which is why i i, I asked the animal rights community that i think uh considering our entire movement is based out of compassion empathy and equality of a non-human species maybe we could be we could be the one movement that actually says let's find an alternative system to this constant demand for incarceration that's all i'm saying our anger is justified i am not i, I our anger is completely justified the horror the, the horror the horror of the stories of abuse are is real the pain people feel and the animals feel is indescribable indescribable right it's it's very very real i i get that but maybe maybe uh, an ethical position is still an important position to keep at that point and um you know it's also a big question with regards to the modifications for the pca act which also suggests that maybe there should be a bigger fine and uh, the you know I, i've talked to some activists in kerala and uh, it's interesting that uh they think that an increased penalty would be helpful not because it would be enough but because it would just get the police officer or whoever they want to complain to just it would let them it would make them listen to them more so then uh, could we distinguish between how the law functions maybe with in maybe for an organization or maybe at a larger structural level and how it plays out in uh, does it play out differently with activists on the ground uh, can i can i use uh, the penalty uh, point as a segue to uh, take you through some uh, very interesting legislative history on the subject in india if you don't mind Oh, for sure go ahead <laughs> because it's a very interesting point you know and i, I and it, it is very interesting actually because of uh, uh this idea of this punishment of rupees 50 is very interesting you know because this punishment of rupees 50 was actually not introduced in 1960 it was introduced in 1890 because the prevention of cruelty to animals act was first brought into india in 1890 uh by uh by a bunch of uh, british housewives in living in india and working in india uh, living in india who uh, wanted to create a specific law to punish uh, people who were mishandling working animals so for example the definition of animals in it only included working animals and draft animals and the punishment was rupees 50 and uh, now the modern 1960 law was actually an incredibly well debated well researched well like you know nationally kind of debated law because what a lot of people don't don't know is that so the, so the law was a product of a private bill that was tabled in 1954 by rukmini arundel uh the the uh, nominated rajya sabha parliamentarian who was a great theosophist and pacifist and an animal rights scholar and activist and it's very interesting and i have the speech here and i can share it with you guys i don't know if you guys have read it because in 1954 while she tabled the speech she gave the uh, the, the bill she gave this mass so she tabled a new bill of prevention of cruelty she said the 1890 bill is really old and we need a new law so she uh, tabled this really like uh, so she kind of addressed the house with this fantastic speech on animal rights which covered every topic on animal rights in 1954 our parliament was 4 years old our constitution was 4 years old we were such a new young country peter singer had not written animal liberation he wrote it 20 years later just think of it okay and you you have this fantastic indian scholar activist a uh, parliamentarian who uh, 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 a a a feminist leader who uh, uh, gave this uh, speech in the indian parliament which 
Uh, and she obviously asked for a higher punishment. She asked for, you know, a lot of restriction on animal exploitation. And Nehru intervened and Nehru said that, you know what, I'm totally with you. We should do something. This is an important issue and we should talk about it. But I'm not sure we can go as far as, as you're a little extreme. We can't go, we can't be that extreme. So, but Nehru did something really amazing, you know, and it's very interesting because this is stuff that doesn't happen in a parliament anymore. This is the bygone days. So uh, Nehru set up a parliamentary standing committee, a parliamentary standing committee with 12 senior parliamentarians and government officers. And it was one of the first, it was one of the first parliamentary standing committee to be created. And it traveled through some eight states in India. It received 422 detailed submissions and it published a 400-page report that was stable in the parliament in 1957, which basically tried to examine what a new modern law on animal cruelty should look like. And when it was stabled again in the parliament in 1959, uh, uh, when the bill was being debated, a lot of parliamentarians got up and they said, you know what? We must protect animals from cruelty. But we can't subject farmers to harsh punishments. It's a very interesting, and I thought it was a very interesting, you know, this is a new young socialist India, you know, really worried about the poor and the farming communities. And at that time, so I'll quote, make a few quotes. So for example, in the Rajya Sabha debates, debates on the prevention of cruelty to animal uh, bill 1959, it was urged that by the act may be abused by the police and mischievous neighbors to harass innocent farmers and people. This is said by Srimati T. Uh, Nallamuthu Ramamurthy, a Rajya Sabha MP, in March 2nd, 1960. Then once again in 1982, so, so we have a 1960 law that comes into force with rupees 50. So they don't know what to do. Rupees 50 doesn't mean the same thing in 1960 that it meant in 1890, but they decided to stick to rupees 50. So the, 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 the law is passed with rupees 50 as a, as a fine. And the only time the PCA has been substantially amended between 1960 and today was in 1982, when actually killing an animal was added as an offense under, under the PCA. Once again, once again, it was debated that rupees 50 is a very low punishment. We need to fix it. So once again, so another, uh, so actually that time, the Minister of State for Agriculture and Rural Development, R.V. Swaminathan, he said, these people... I mean, you, we can critique what he said, but this is what he said. These people who indulge in this crime are all very poor people. They are villagers and farmers and also very innocent people. Without knowing what they are doing, they commit the crime. Therefore, sir, we have to be a little lenient and we should not impose very high punishment. If they cannot pay, they will have to go to jail only. So, I mean, I, I think... In our anger with the abysmal rupees 50 punishment, we forget that it was not something that was not discussed, that not thought about. There was a discussion. It was a discussion that was very important in a moment of time because it's very important to understand. So, you can please allow me to finish for a second. Because cruelty as an offense, a colonial common law offense, was only imagined as a system to regulate our behavior with animals we use or exploit for work. That was it. It was, it was a very limited offense created because it is, you know, cruelty is defined on the scale of unnecessary suffering. So cruelty can never be eradicated. It can just be reduced. That's it. It can just be reduced from a scale to ten, of 10 to 2. That's it. It can never be completely eradicated. That's the meaning of cruelty. And it was an offense created. It was a common law offense created just to address the nature between man and a working animal. Because a man needs a working animal to survive for various reasons. An animal obviously will only do the work if the animal has been forced to do through some kind of pain and uh, coercive measure. What we see today is a very different scenario. And that's what our report captures. We see senseless, senseless, horrendous acts of crime against free living street dogs. That is the most common kind of crime we see. These are, these are, these are not working animals. These are animals that live on the street. They are seen as a nuisance. They are seen as there's a real anger towards these animals. The law was the law never contemplated these crimes. The law had never contemplated these crimes. The law was designed to contemplate just our relationship and regulate our relationship with working animals. Now the same law is being used to address these crimes of real kind of violent crimes against street animals. 
and i think uh, and i think which is where both the idea of rupees 50 and the idea of cruelty falls completely short because so my point really is we have to abandon these ideas i mean, actually I, i i i think cruelty is as dangerous a concept as as sodomy because it's a colonial construct you know it's a colo- colonial construct which has no purpose in a modern society because we have also started using that term now so every time an animal is injured we say cruel why why don't we say violence why don't we say torture why do we not use the word torture enough and we i mean you know uh, krishna only and i work on captive elephants in kerala and now increasingly in our work we use the word torture this is not animal cruelty what i mean this is much much worse so i'm just saying that cruelty is a very dangerous term but historically it was meant for a limited purpose and now it is being used for a very wide gamut of issues so that's really helpful and you go ahead thanks susan and um thank you alok i um i agree with uh, almost everything that you said here um i just like you also agree um and believe that the work of activists should be scrutinized and that they shouldn't be put up on let's say a moral high ground or a pedestal just because they are activists um i say this also having seen a lot of times that people try to intervene when they see instances of violence towards animals or um, other forms of problematic behavior but sometimes they don't see it through to the end or sometimes what they think will make the situation better is not necessarily making the situation better so they mean well the intentions are there but the measures are really uh, problematic in themselves so totally agree with what you said on that i also agree that punitive measures as a solution are not the solution that they are problematic i don't um i cannot support capital punishment for example just as you said not even for the rarest of rare crimes it's um i don't think it's the job of the state to be out for vengeance um that shouldn't be the way but that said uh, i also acknowledge and feel that these measures the punitive measures that the state takes and that people call for very often in terms of punishment of uh, varying degrees of severity are the easy way out they the quick fix ways out they mean uh, they basically imply that people don't have to think about what they're doing you know it's just a formula of if you do this you get punished in this way so don't do it but we know that punishments and enhancing uh, laws do not really have a deterrent effect we've seen that in the case of multiple types of crimes absolutely so that's not the way out either so i am interested in knowing deeply curious to know what could alternative ways look like um and secondly um i am interested and curious to know where does neglect figure if we think of crimes against animals there are most of the cases that we come across that we read about that are documented at least in newspapers or by activists are cases of outright torture and violence maiming killing poisoning hanging flogging but there are a whole lot of animals out there that are not being flogged or maimed or um, subjected to boiling water or acid but they are suffering because of abject levels of neglect that they are um Hello Anu I can So where does that figure Anu we lost you for a second there do you want her to repeat the question No no I understood it so as uh, it's questions of neglect I mean as a very I uh, thank thank you for your uh, detailed comment Anu and I really appreciate it and I'm really I, I was a little scared because I thought I, I went I thought I went rogue for a bit so I'm very I'm feeling a little comforted with your with your support so I'm very grateful for that and uh, and uh, and i do go rogue often so this is actually as a occupational hazard <laughs> with me but um um i mean neglect is a very interesting issue and you know neglect is something actually the pca really thinks about because it says very clearly that see once again once again the very section 3 am i right alvin the section 3 is really about custody of the animal right so there's somebody who has custody of the animal so it's very important you really think about if you read the law very carefully you realize the law is only concerned with animals that are useful to humans if you just do a critical reading of the law the law is very specifically looking at animals that are in my possession 
in my control as a human being. I, they are in my barn. They're really about barn animals. The law is about the law is a law imagining a medieval farm, 15th century farm, where I get out of my house, I get on my horse, I take my cows, and I go on the field, I graze them, and I come back. That's what the law is interested in. The law is not looking at free living street dogs. Our politics today is very different. Our politics today does not meet the requirements of the law at all. Having said that, having said that, I mean, I'm sorry, just, I, I see this issue slightly differently because I feel it's very problematic, A, first of all, that the law is caught in a time warp where a protection of animal is only important if the animal is important to the human. Because it's very, very, so the usefulness of the animal is very key to the human contract of protection because the PC is offering some sort of protective contract only if the animal is useful to the humans. And within that space, we have this idea of duty to care, right? Because the duty of to care only extends to animals that are in my possession. So I actually do not have a duty to care for an animal that is on the street. I cannot be charged for or neglect because a street dog died in front of my house. Can, can, can I, Alvin? No, right? Um, I, I have a very different uh, stand here, though. But I think I'll probably pitch in when you're done. Okay, okay. So, so but having said that, uh, having said that, uh, uh, a lot of cases are filed on neglect. I have filed a lot of complaints on neglect. Uh, I live in Goa where we have uh, uh, this big, big practice of dhiri or bullfights. And we file cases all the time with farmers, uh, of, uh, uh, on, including on the question of neglect. I have, uh, many times we have rescued dogs from houses uh, and cats from houses, uh, uh, sometimes cattle from houses. Uh, emaciated, tied up in some corner, somebody, you know, a, a stench of a wound was coming out of the neighborhood. So, yeah, so, you know, like abject neglect, abject. And I think for me, the, uh, politically, the question the answer really is that actually for a lot of people, uh, there is really no, there is a deliberate disregard to suffering. Actually, you know, we live in a society where suffering is not something that evokes the same kind of, uh, uh, kind of anger, often, you know, I mean, uh, for everybody in the sense that, uh, uh, let me put it this way, we live in a society with so much suffering. People see so much suffering in their lives all around. When you go in as an animal activist and you go tell some rural person who's some 80 or 60 year old woman who's seen suffering, that, oh my God, you, you have no heart. Look at this cow dying there. I don't think, you know, it evokes the same kind of, a, there's, there's a real cognitive dissonance because I don't think we are communicating because that woman is like, I have seen so much suffering in my life. You know, I don't, I don't see suffering the same way you see suffering. So I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, I think, um, I, I just give you my simple answer. I think the questions. I don't want people to be arrested for neglecting animals. I want the animals to be cared for, and I, I, I want a dialogue. I, I don't want, I, you know, you know, the arm of criminal law is so dangerous and counterproductive in animal protection. It only creates the conversations that much more difficult. It makes access to animals that need care that much more difficult. It makes, it, may, it creates, you know, it makes, it gives animal activism a really bad name. We become these really bad people. We become these really bad people everywhere. We become the, you know, we are not the heroes of the society. We are the, we are the villains of society. You know, the so society sees us collectively, and not because, and I'm not giving the society a moral high ground either. But I'm just saying that somehow our effectiveness is lost because of the use of excessive use of criminal law. That's all. Alvin, would you like to jump in? Yes, Alvin. Um, Alvin, go go attack me, Alvin. At no, tear no, me no. apart. No. Um, so I mean, I understand when Alok says <laughs> he comes from his own point of view, but then um, when I the reason why owner in um, the PCA is defined as a person who has custody of animals is not to sort of um, cr create this argument that only if you possess the animal, you are capable of being cruel to the animal. Um, the reason why that's done is because ownership of animal is a real thing in India, right? You can own an animal. Um, and ownership in some cases, of course, an elephant you can privately own, but um, where the government gives you ownership certificates. But in other cases, you can still own a dog. Like there are, uh, there's a license a BBMP can give you when you own a dog. There's a, 
Um, you have medical records of an animal and the law assumes that you are the owner of that animal. The reason why ownership under the PCA is defined not as somebody who has title over the animal, but as somebody who has possession over the animal is because if I've, by any chance, I give custody of my animal to somebody else. And if they treat the animal with cruelty, um, technically they are not the owner, but they are still liable under PCA because at that moment they were in possession of that animal. Even with street animals, right? When you are committing an act of violence against a street animal, uh, at that moment, at the instance of the crime, you are in possession of that animal. That animal is in, is in your control. So I will make an argument that the reason why, why owner under the PCA is defined on the basis of possession, uh, because ideally street animals are owned by what the government or the, by, by the municipality. So if at that moment you are in possession of that animal, especially when you're committing an act of crime or any of the offenses under section 11, um, you are for the purpose of the act in possession of the animal at that point, and hence uh, punishable under PCA. So I feel that possession um, is, is, not, is not a standard where you know, you're only sort of protecting useful animals, uh, but you are protecting animals in general from anybody who, who um, treats, it, treats that animal cruel, in a cruel manner, irrespective of whether they own the animal or not. I, I just want to follow up on something you said, Alok, before we take a question from the chat, uh, which is that, you know, again, it's, it, this is something, uh, when I had discussed the PC with an activist from Kerala, she said that uh, it, cruelty as defined in the PC is, it's, it, it, she said that it covers everything. Um, that it is uh, comprehensive because it lists clearly all the different actions that you could possibly do to an animal. And I was thinking about your comment about, uh, you know, you go to a village and ask an old woman and tell her what about animal suffering, then she would probably say, well, you know, I have seen much more suffering than all this. So in 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 such cases where cruelty itself because of our own position and how we perceive uh, cruelty against us as much more important. Uh, do you think uh, listing objectively as what counts as cruelty is useful from a legal point of view? I mean, first, I... can you hear me? Yes, yes. In... Okay, I mean, uh, uh, first, let at least for the at least for the purpose of this Zoom conversation, let's abandon the word term cruelty, and let's say crimes against animals. So for crimes against animals, I think uh, I actually uh, for a, my radical demand, obviously, uh, is that uh, crimes against animals must uh, fall within the same system of IPC where crimes against humans are. So, for example, uh, the IPC should be used to cover crimes against animals. Why not? Because the crimes have been committed by human beings. And the IPC is actually designed to punish humans who commit violent crimes. So it's, it's I, IPC should be victim neutral. So my entire my political my political argument is that IPC should be victim neutral. Why should I be punished under IPC for beating a man or a woman and punished under a completely diluted provision for similarly beating an animal? So for my first point really is that I think uh, we already have a robust legal system that is looking at uh, finding. Uh, uh, looking at the addressing the issue of crime now whether it's how do we fix that is a different, different issue and i understand what i'm asking for through the ipc is a highly uh highly uh utopian and impractical idea and it, you know it won't happen so i would like to see a similar classification of crimes of uh, of crimes i would like a distinction made between the way in which crime occurs on a regular basis in people's idea when people use animals for riding or working or labor or all kinds, of, you know, working animals. And I would really like maybe a more stricter regime uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of some kind of a, a more uh, legal system that uh, looks at really violent crimes against animals. So, for example, if you look at the report, we have we've created a totally different section on violent crimes against animals because we decided that we must define that category separately. Because obviously, I understand that in practical this thing, we have to address crimes against animals, and, and I think uh, so. And so, I'm saying we create a hierarchy. So, for example, you know, I mean, I, I'll give you my answer. I mean, my, uh, you know, so 
I get a lot of complaints. Uh, people find out my number and they call me and they say, somebody has tied up their dog. You know, I want to file a police complaint. The dog is tied up in a very short leash. And I, I just tell them this is ridiculous. Just go and talk to them. Request them to extend the leash a little bit, leash a little bit because this is not this is not a battle I want to fight. Okay, I'm just so my point. I'm just so I'm. Uh, 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 but then you know, if somebody is come and poisoned like ten dogs on the beach, and we found ten dogs on the beach, and uh, I mean that's a very serious issue. We have found or. Uh, uh, I mean, there are. The concept of a one word crime, cruelty, you know, it, 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 it robs the animals of the dignity of understanding what they've gone through sometimes. Because, because you know, uh, in the cases I've documented, just of animal sexual abuse, the kind of cases we have seen, to call them cruelty, which is the same thing as tying up an animal in, in a slightly tight manner, I mean, that is ridiculous. That is just sheer ridiculousness, you know. I mean, uh, so I think, you know, like, and even the cops, if you go to a cops, go to the cops about a case of animal sexual abuse, they will call it animal cruelty. They'll say, oh, but this is animal cruelty. So this cruelty is, a, so I'm just saying cruelty as a concept must be disregarded. We must create, definitely create a language of hierarchy, hierarchy of crimes. And, and we must uh, exclude, exclude uh, the, the, the interaction, the daily interaction humans have with working animals from it. And that must really be part of a dialogue. And serious, grievous crimes of uh, harm and torture and violence against animals must be treated through criminal law. And, and without, uh, without uh, there could be punitive measures, Anu, but not loss of liberty. So, for example, I would say community service. I consider community service as one of the greatest forms of punishment. Because community service... Is something that you you take time and understand what you've done, because I think the most important thing for somebody to understand. Actually, there's a lot of fantastic psychological reports and uh, documentation and writing which says that giving people a reasonable time of, you know, reflection on why they've done it, you know, and maybe you know t t with a little bit of shame attached to it, is sufficient for sometimes for people to experience some kind of remorse, you know. That's, you know, that achieves the purpose. I would be very happy. I don't want it to be a vengeance-led kind of system where we, you know, you know uh, blood for blood shit. But, um, so, I mean, I think, you know, but people, I, I wish there was a training for animal activists on, you know, on, on politics and society, on crimes. I think animal activists should read uh, what, the, what, what happened during the Gudra riots. I think animal activists should read what happened after the Gudra, after the Gudra incident in Gujarat. They should read what happened after the partition in India. They should read what happens. The kind of crimes that take place in our society on a daily basis. And animal activists must speak for other victims. They must speak across in different movements. They can't just be a single issue. You know, the single issue politics is a very problematic idea. The reason why animal activists are not taken seriously at all is because they only speak up when an animal is injured. And 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 they never speak up on any other issue. They never. So they will never. So my my so my thing is, the animal rights movement should be the first movement to speak against issue, cases of lynching. Why are we quiet? Why are we quiet when somebody is lynched for carrying any uh, for beef? That is the greatest gravest error, uh, the mistake the animal rights movement has made. So I think you know there's a lot uh, to, uh, the animal rights movement has to answer for. Sorry, I just let that in. <laughs> okay. I think, <laughs> I think you can you can <laughs> you can edit me out like or you can expunge my remarks as our speaker is done in the parliament today. You know, you're the lawyer, not me. <laughs> I'm just going to read out Parthi's question, which I think connects well with what you're speaking about, which is if uh, suffering of animals will ever be seen through the lens of systemic oppression, like work around gender, poverty, caste, and marginalization is seen as. Is that kind of parity possible? I mean, that is, the, that is I mean, a fantastic question. And I'm glad Bharti asked me the question. Thank you, Bharti. And, uh, and, and, and Bharti and I talk about this a lot. And, you know, we, 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 and we both uh, have a very similar politics on this. And, we, and, I, and I, I think it's very important. It's important that our... Uh, the, the animal rights movement, the language, our language is l l lacking a political foundation. 
it's desperately lacking a political foundation. And you know, in that, in such a space, we talk about issues in such vacuum that uh, that is that is the real that the real crisis of the modern animal rights movement in India, which is why we have this complete takeover by the Hindu uh, right of the animal rights movement. And so, yes, we have to, you know, the animal rights movement must be built. Can I can I read a small uh, uh, line from Ca uh, Carol Adams, if I if I may be permitted? So this is my paper called uh, The Despise and the Dishonored, the Non-Human Beats and the Non-Conforming Kairati. It's about my work on animal sexual abuse. It's published in the NUJS Law Review. You can Google and find it. Uh, okay. So uh, Carol Adam, say, uh, Carol, Adam argue, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Adam argues that violence against animals cannot be understood without a feminist analysis because this violence is, is one aspect of a patriarchal culture arising within and receiving legitimate legitimate legitimization from the way male sexual identity is constituted as as dominant you know in a patriarchal heteronormative system animal victims do become feminized and uh, <laughs> So an overarching hierarchy comes into play, which substitutes and reconfigures our understanding in which, more appropriately, men have power over women, feminized men, and feminized animals. And, uh, and this is obviously my queer critique of it. But, you know, uh, there is something that... Uh, uh, I'll just give you a little perspective on this, because Krishna and I have been talking about this a little bit also in our work with Captive Elephants. You know, thus these heroic acts of violence on the elephants are enacted by the Mahouts. All men, these men gather, they, met, they gather together. They say, it's like a private party where they sort of inflict extreme violence on the animal. It is toxic masculinity at its, its in, you know, in full display. In full display. We have the language. We already have the language to understand what's happening. We must use it. I mean, the feminist, the feminist language is the most important political tool to understand why majority of perpetrators, please don't give me the one example of the woman from Bangalore, the one example from the woman from somewhere else, the majority, the 99% majority of perpetrators of real violent crimes against animals are men. And, you know, I mean, the Jalikattu is uh, the, uh, it's played by men. Uh, every uh, captive elephant abuser is a man. I mean, this is a very important thing for us to understand. This is the this, this these these acts of violence are a product of toxic masculinity. Krishnani, would you like to go next? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alok. It was like it's really fresh to be on a platform where we don't have to talk about Hachu Kotaka Ramachandran, and we can talk about <laughs> like, yeah, like the the yeah the animal left days and all that. So uh, I just want to ask, look, so. Uh, with the PCA Act and the slaughterhouse rules and all that. So when I <clears throat> when I've been to slaughterhouses in Hyderabad, uh, the obviously the rule says that uh, you know one animal is not supposed to see another animal being slaughtered, and you know all these sections should be clearly demarcated and you know separated and all that. But when we go to a slaughter, it's never like that. There are like a corner. There's a corner where the goats are waiting, and then there's a slaughter happening right in front of them, and then the processing, and then the selling also happens within the same hall. In the case of buffalo, it's all over the place. There's, there's no possibility where, you know, a clear uh, assembly line or, you know, like a conveyor belt sort of a system of the modern slaughterhouse can be followed even. So, and even in the case of the captive elephant uh, rules, where they say that uh, there should be at least four meter distance between each elephant. And, uh, and also that um, the uncle should not be used and all that. So uh, is there like a case where, uh, you know, during the very framing of these rules, uh, the very non-enforceability uh, of these rules is, is, is sort of like coded into these rules during its own framing. So how, how exactly should we like look at these laws? Because one way that one of my teachers has said that the constitution is like a, is an aspirational model. Uh, so is that how we are supposed to look at the PCA Act and the Captive Elephant Management Rules? Because uh, even during the, framing of these rules, it was obviously 
clear that the, that a Purim or you know a festival or any of these events cannot really happen or even slaughter cannot really happen uh, by adhering to these rules. So how exactly should we look at these rules? Are they like just made for the sake of it or is an enforceability in you know possible in the near future? I mean, it's a fantastic question, Krishna. You're right. I mean, and I think it's a question I think about a lot. And you know, it's, it's something. I mean, this is the so you know, and I'm sure you, uh, Professor Francione, I know came and spoke in one of your uh, before, and Professor Francione is a big, is a is very critical of welfare laws, as you all know, and he always argues that you know he's this very fantastic line, and he says that welfare just blunts, blunts the sharp edge of the knife, and that's all, all that's all it does, and. Uh, So I think it's important to understand, you're right, it's very important to recognize that welfare laws as we see them today are merely a smokescreen. They achieve nothing. They achieve absolutely nothing. They're impossible to implement. They're impossible to implement because they're never designed with the perspective of actually the person who's running a slaughterhouse either. Because just, just God forbid, God forbid the animal activists who are making policy actually sat down with the slaughterhouse uh, uh, companies and said, you know, let's create something that you can actually implement. Because we are creating rules and policies sitting in our AC offices in Delhi with not speaking to a single person who runs a slaughterhouse. So how is the slaughterhouse going to improve? It's a, you know, it's kind of, it's a very, but at the same time, the whole idea of the Pura is that the elephants are standing next to each other. That space is so small. You know, I mean, you know, the elephants cannot be spread out and the four meter distance means nothing. If you keep the elephants four meter apart, it makes zero difference to how completely horrible the uh, the horrendousness of the uh, Purim doesn't even reduce by a second by, by by anything. I mean the risks and everything. So I think uh, I think uh, uh, I don't. I let me be okay. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. We are just starting a study here in Goa. In the taluka that I live in, it's called Bardes, which is a subdivision of the North District. And, uh, and we have the, one of the largest restaurant uh, industry in India, actually, the very large restaurants. And we're doing a small study under my Center for Research on Animal Rights, where we're looking at how the small pig farming consumption has gone up because just the restaurant industry is driving the pig, pig trade. And one of the things you want to do is actually work with the small farmers and see, and the small slaughterhouses, because what's happening is because uh, so many restaurants have opened up, the slaughterhouses are opening up everywhere now suddenly. So people are hearing uh, pigs screaming through the night as they're being, you know, beaten to death uh, in, in behind somebody's house. And uh, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, reach out to these small... And the thing is, these are very small farming, small businesses. They're run by a small, like, you know, uh, you know, so lots of families will farm pigs in their house and their fields. And then one guy will buy all of them and slaughter them, right? To sell them to the restaurant. So... We are trying to see how we can improve the welfare of the pigs by actually working with the, with the person who's going to run the slaughterhouse uh, to see how we can improve uh, the, the, the slaughterhouse. Okay, maybe, maybe we don't know what the result of the study will be. We're actually doing it like a study because I don't think anybody's done anything like this. So we're trying something different because uh, what is the point of creating a rule or a system meant for somebody who doesn't, who's not consulted and who's not going to be able to use it. And I think, uh, so the difficult conversations are the conversations we have with people we don't want to actually talk to. So, uh, uh, so I think, let's see, uh, Krishna, this is my, but I think welfare laws by and large are a sort of a very kind of, I think they just, I don't think they really work. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the Purim, Purim welfare laws should actually say only 10 elephants in the last day of Purim. Then maybe it's a really substantial law. It is not saying that. So it doesn't really substantially change the Purim. So I don't know. Professor Rukuni, do you have questions? Yeah. Um, go ahead, but we can't hear you very well. I can't hear anybody. 
Right. I think. Um, okay. I think maybe in the meantime, we'll just take Alvin's question. Go ahead. Okay, this wasn't really a question, but I think I wanted to clarify a little bit about what um, Krishna Uni asked about how to make laws implementable. Um, I think I want to just narrate an example of what we in Karnataka did. Uh, I don't know if you know that there were breeding laws uh, to regulate breeding of dogs, which was passed by the central government in 2018, uh, which was one of the rules under the PCA Act. And uh, quite honestly, the rules uh, were extremely difficult for any breeder to implement. So what the Kannada government did instead was to actually call the Breeders Association, uh, have a meeting with them and talk to them about what they can, what they can't implement and what they're having difficulties in implementing. And they decided to actually bring about amendments to the PCA rules to make the rules a lot more implementable. So it is possible, I think if there is state action, if there is uh, a decision by the state government to actually reach out to the stakeholders, put them on a call and have a conversation about what is acceptable and what is not given the framework of the law, given the objective of the law, uh, it is possible to make laws um, enforceable. Um, I just had a quick question um, in case we can't hear anybody else. I, I just wanted to position this whole conversation uh, and see whether it would fit in a discourse of animal rights as well. Because one of the uh, one of the points that you make in your report is that an animal has a right to life. Where is it? I feel like whenever we're discussing these things um, and we're discussing how these things play out and what activists and academics uh, can do about these issues, I feel like, and I'm not sure if this is the Indian context specifically, but it, it's just impossible to talk about stuff in a way which may not be the welfareist model per se, but in its very nuance comes pretty close to articulating the welfareist model. So, you know, the, when we're thinking about, you know, let's expand the concept of cruelty and or discard it altogether and think about crimes against animals or violence or torture, then it, does that push us towards a language of rights? So are we still thinking about welfare? So, uh, I mean, uh, great questions. And, uh, you know, and I'm really so excited to hear them because uh, they're challenging the way I think about things. And I really appreciate them. And, uh, and so, you know, how about I say something different, a little different? What is the goal of the animal rights movement in India? It's very important. Let's define that. What is our immediate goal? Or what is our goal in 20 years from now? It's not clear. It's very important to understand what is, you know, for example, I was, I'm a gay man. I've been part of the gay rights movement for a long time. For a long time, the goal of the gay rights movement was to strike down 377. We achieved it. I said, bye-bye. I'm not interested in same-sex marriage. I'm done. I'm done with the gays. Okay. <laughs> they can have it for themselves. What is the goal of the animal rights movement? I don't understand. Because is for a long and so for me, for me, I, I would like to propose a goal, okay? Because, you know, I, I actually, I cannot accept, while I understand it's a, it's a correct ethical moral choice, I cannot accept veganism as a goal of the movement because we are a, we are a meat-eating society. We are a society where almost more than 85% of people eat meat and more than 99% of people, 100% of people eat, uh, uh, consume dairy. So we are not a vegetarian or a vegan society by, by far. So that is not a goal of any kind. How about our goal is actually to challenge the relationship of animals as property? How about we say that actually we want, we want to make a massive dent to the legal system, the system that creates animals for property. Why are animals property? So for example, if I need to use an animal elephant for a Purim or a temple festival, why must I own the elephant? Why must I own the elephant? Why can't I obtain the elephant on a short-term license from the forest department? So, for example, I wanted to jelly cut too. Why must I own the bull? Why can't the bull be owned by the animal husbandry department, which is a state agency, so we can actually put pressure on them to take care of the animal? And we borrow the bull for two days uh, on the license. I mean, you know, ideally, of course not, but I'm just giving an example, right? Uh, so, for example, my do I don't own my dogs. I do you know, people tell me, oh, you, your, 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 who's the owner of this dog? What is this nonsense? This dog is, I'm not a, this dog is not property. I don't own this dog. This dog is my family. 
so this idea of property ownership of animals is the most problematic idea because as long as animals are property welfare is an impossible idea to achieve because something that has a status of property you have absolute control over it when you have absolute control over it whatever a welfare regulation might say you will do whatever you want with it that is the crux of the problem because your belief system says i have absolute control over this thing i can do whatever i want with it we have to challenge that and take away that control by saying you can never really absolute will be an absolute owner of a living being and i think that is a, possibly a great goal for the animal rights movement uh, and and i think and, and if you create a goal like that i think uh, uh, it might actually improve welfare legislation but i think you need a principal goal we need a principal goal for the animal rights movement so i i would so that's how i would answer that question sorry thanks so much alok i don't see any other hands up it's been wonderful talking to you it's it, uh, very interesting perspectives and um, i'm so glad you were able to join us and that we could all hear you <laughs> thanks, so much. thanks so much thank you so much thank you i'm really grateful thank you so much thank you goodbye thanks bye everyone.